Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would answer Upper Tier Patron emails. This first email is from anonymous annual Upper Tier Patron from Arizona. She writes, can you please explain the psychology of the inner child concept? Is it even a thing or is it just a bunch of mumbo jumbo? What might we, we gain? What might we gain from healthily relating to our own inner child? Are there modalities or protocols that can be used in therapy to soothe an inner child? End of email. Yeah, this is a great question because we often are referring to the inner child, but what do we mean by that? And, you know, me, I I like to define things. And when I'm talking about something with someone and we haven't properly defined it, it kind of irks me. Like I feel a, a kind of a, you know, that feeling when you rub a tin foil against each other or two styrofoam things. I don't know. Does that bother you? It really just drives me nuts. Uh, it's that kind of feeling. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, a brief history of the term inner child. I think Carl Jung actually coined the term uh, in the early 20th century. I'm not sure, but I think he was talking about how we're all born with an inner child archetype and this, this inner child needs to be healed by a a parent side of ourself or something like that. I don't know. I'm not exactly up on Carl Jung's ideas, but I do know that at least the idea of an inner child comes from that. But I don't think it is the same concept that eventually was uh, being used when I was coming up as even as a kid, I remember an inner child being talked about. I think from my memory, the term inner child became popularized in the self-help movement in the 80s, maybe the 70s, maybe the 60s, but I remember it really coming into its own in the 80s. And if you look online, there are hundreds, if not thousands of books published back then and since on the concept of the inner child. Um, One popular book by Dr. Lucia Capcioni called Recovery of Your Inner Child. And the chapters in this book, um, this book's from 1991, I believe. The chapters are uh, just some of the chapters. Meeting your inner, so how to meet your inner child, how to embrace your inner child, how to accept your inner child, how to accept your anger from your inner child, how to find your nurturing parent, how to heal the wounds of childhood, how to celebrate your creative child, how to discover your spiritual child. So what do they mean by all this? And is it, the, is it actually a thing? Well, no, I mean, nothing, uh, most things in psychology aren't actually a thing. It's a construct, a model, a, a way of conceptualizing the mind. We can't open up the body or the mind and find the inner child. <laughs> it doesn't exist, but it is a way of conceptualizing things. And There's a lot of uh, literature and a lot of conceptualizing around the mind around parts work and how we all have different parts to ourselves. There is some science behind this, actually, different modes that we go into seemingly. Um, But anyway, you know, like a real common example of different modes or parts or selves that we all have are when you're hanging out with your buddies, your friends, people that you trust, people that you can say really bad jokes around (laughs) crass jokes around Uh, that's a mode that you go into and and you might start swearing more around them and you might say certain things or laugh at certain things and then when you go to work and you hang out with people you don't know that well you have a different mode you're not going to swear as much you won't and when you hear a swear word it'll feel different you know like when you're around your friends that swear a lot well i'll just talk about for myself (laughs) when i'm around my friends we swear a, a lot even my wife And uh, I don't know about a lot, but, you know, some. And when I hear swear words, I don't even hear them. Like, there was a time when I thought that Umberto never swore. it, It just somehow got into my head that he never swore. But then over time, I started noticing that he did swear, but I just didn't register it. I just had this belief that he didn't swear, but he does swear. Maybe not as much as I do, but anyway. So when I'm around certain people, I will... I will register swear words, but I won't really hear them. Whereas if I'm at work and I hear a swear word, it really sticks out. You know, if one of my colleagues was to swear in the middle of a meeting, I'd be like, huh? So 
uh, and it'll feel differently to me. It'll feel more abrasive. It'll feel more offensive. You know, so one way to conceptualize that is that we have these different parts. Anyway, point is, is that uh, what is the inner child? Well, there isn't really a definition. It is used in the clinical literature, actually. You, you would think this would be one of those terms that would just be in the self-help literature, but it is found in respectable journals by respectable authors. For example, Furman and Russell in 1994 wrote about it, and they said that as we, you know, I'm just paraphrasing them, they said, as we live our lives, each era of our life impacts our later life. So your inner child is somehow encoded based on experiences and subjective experience, and that inner child affects us when we're 45. Um, but I think it's broadly used in my circle to refer to the fact or the idea, the model, that we all have an inner child, a part of ourselves that is innocent and maybe scared, you know, the way that children are scared of the outside world. They're not sure of things. They're insecure, but they're also open. They're, um, they're not uh, conditioned by society yet regarding materialism or bigotry or something, right? Children don't usually understand these things. It's like, why does everyone care about that kind of thing? Why does everyone care about the color of other people's skin? Why do people, you know, why does daddy work 80 hours a week when I just want to hang out with him? That kind of thing. Uh, children are open and innocent and uh, pure and good <laughs> and all these kinds of things, but also scared and vulnerable and, um, you know, uh, it's a difficult life. I incompetent. Children are incompetent. They don't know things. They don't know how to do things. So I think that uh, this inner child concept is used to represent that part of us that is still like that. You know, there was a part of us that used to see the world in all of its wonders, and we used to have optimism, and we used to uh, be open to things, and we used to see other human beings as, as good. We didn't assume things about other people the way that we get conditioned to, to later in life or based on later experiences. So I think that that's one thing about accessing an inner child uh, uh, that can be helpful to go to. And I think, you know, it's interesting to think about, right, that, that there was a time when we were like that and there's a part, maybe a part of us that's still kind of like that. Another angle, though, is that the inner child holds the traumas that we experienced. So uh, you could almost consider this like an internal family systems thing. I'm sure that they talk about this at times. And the idea that if, for example, you were, I don't know, uh, criticized a lot as a, as a child, as a young child, and as an adult, you have all these ways of defending against criticism by being narcissistic or criticizing other people before they can criticize you or whatever, or acting like you're tough, like you don't care. But you have this inner child that absolutely cares and is still wounded by childhood experiences and, and by subsequent experiences as well. And so in therapy, if I might say to someone, you know, they're being tough and, and they're, yeah, I don't really care about when, you know, when, when people at work say that I'm useless, I, I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't really affect me. But I, as a therapist, hearing this from a client think that maybe it does affect them. I might be like, well, what is your inner child? How does your inner child feel about it? And there might be a way of giving the person focus and permission to uh, reveal and to embody how they really feel deep down. And that's another idea of the inner child. This is, it, there's other ways of accessing those feelings, but um, that's one way. And the idea goes is that not only do we have an inner child, but we have an inner tween, an inner teen, and maybe even an inner adult that um, might also be still with us. Those uh, ideas, you know, like um, an, an inner teenager for me uh, i guess if i were to talk about it would be that i think i i really kind of felt my inner teenager the other day i was looking out the window and listening to music and i think i felt this frequent feeling i had or at least i think i had when i was a teenager where i just had so many plans <laughs> and so many things that I wanted to do and accomplish and 
uh, not just, you know, it will really almost nothing to do with a career, but more just like life things. You know, I want to, I want to drive a car over a hundred miles an hour. <laughs> I want to, I want to bungee jump. I, w- I want to go to Vegas and b- bet money on, on roulette. I don't know, you know, there's just that feeling that you have when you're a young person and you finally have the ability to maybe do some of these things that you see on TV or you hear about. And, um, or, you know, I want to buy something extravagant for myself when I get a job. I don't know. And, uh, and then once you start experiencing those things and they become a little mundane, you know, like the first time that I ever bought a guitar for myself, uh, I, it was, I had a job and I was like, Hey, Oh my God, I have money. I I can actually, uh, I'm not living paycheck to paycheck. And I bought a guitar and, and it just, I'll never forget it. But since then I've probably bought, I don't know, 25 guitars. And I don't really remember the feeling I had when I bought the other ones, but I remember the first one. Anyway, point is, is that, you know, I felt this moment of my inner, teenager or inner young adult and it and it felt good you know it felt good to re-feel those feelings and to have that wonder to have that energy and uh, we might be able to tap into that sometime again it, it's it's not a thing it's not a scientific thing it's a model but um so not only when we look to our inner child our our, our inner teens or something are we trying to invoke the the optimism or the I don't know, the developmental benefits of that stage. We're trying to tap into that for our benefit for something. Um, like my mom, for example, she she taps into her inner child all the time, still to this day. She has this uh, wonder in the world, and I've always uh, admired that and and have tried to model myself after. The, the quintessential example would have been 20 years ago, maybe longer, and we were... Uh, having a family reunion in central Washington and it was the summer and it was really warm of course because central Washington so Seattle is you know known to be very temperate and rainy but since just over the mountains in central Washington it's it can, it's very deserty and and in the we're not very deserty but you know it's more extreme in, in the seasons and so in the, in the summer it can get really hot anyway we're over there and we're outside and then all of a sudden it starts to hail and uh, or poor rain or something. I can't remember one of the two. And my mom and every so everyone starts running for shelter, right? And it wasn't that bad. It wasn't like gonna kill anyone, but it was like notable weather. And so we're all taken to shelter. Then my mom grabs uh, her uh, her granddaughter's hand and says, um, "Let's all let's splash in the puddles." And so my mom and uh, you know, her granddaughter, our, uh, my niece, incidentally, are uh, stomping around having fun and giggling and having this great time and screaming in the, in the hail of the heavy rain. And, and I thought, huh, yeah. And then I ran out there with her. <laughs> and there's, there's, a, there's a picture of it that um, someone took at the time. And uh, I get a lot of joy from that. So uh, oh, that might have even been like 30 years ago, actually almost 30 years ago yeah wow (laughs) anyway so my mom really taps into it so but the other aspect of it is we sometimes need to go back to our say say you were traumatized bullied a lot when you were a teenager well it might help to talk from your inner teenager in therapy right or when you're journaling to maybe give attention to your inner teenager to give voice to that part of you that wasn't given a voice back then or taking care of that part of you that wasn't taken care of back then either from a therapist or from yourself or from others something like that you know but that's a great question annual up to your patron uh, about inner child i like questions like that because i'd never thought to even think about what do we mean by this it's just one of those terms that gets thrown around and I think it's important to investigate it. So I want to give a quick update on the complaint that was filed against me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've been 
having my co-hosts read the framed letter. Actually, it's on my office. I can see it right from where I'm at right now. And I'll just read the letter again here. It's from the Department of Health, the department that gives me license to actually provide clinical services. The letter says, the disciplining authority for your marriage and family therapist license credential has received and reviewed a report alleging you committed unprofessional conduct. The report was closed. So just if you don't know, when, whenever you have a client or a patient of a mental health worker or a, a medical worker, like a doctor or a nurse, something like that, you can make a complaint. You can say, uh, hey, this, this licensee did this thing and you need to look into it. And then the licensing board will review. And sometimes it can become a, a long, multi-month, multi-year legal process where you have to pay a lot of lawyers to defend yourself. And then in the end, there will they'll either take away your license or there might even be criminal charges brought about in addition to this or a civil suit in addition in suing or they'll sanction your license by saying that you're on probation for a year and you have to go to supervision or you have to get training or you can't see clients in this format or something like this so when us as therapists when we receive a complaint like this it's really scary usually before I received this letter, I would have I would have said, oh, my God, that's going to freak me out if I ever got that letter. You know, like my mild obsessive compulsive personality disorder traits would really get triggered by this. But when I received the letter, it didn't do that to me. I think it's because I had figured it would happen a long time ago. I, I had heard from other similar content providers like me who had multiple complaints brought up on them for a long time. And I... I was always like, well, yeah, I mean, eventually it's going to happen to me. And then I was, as I was going through the trial last year, last summer, I was like, for sure, someone's going to make a, a complaint. And then as the months kind of went on, I thought, huh, it's weird that no one ever complained to me because there were people online that were saying they were going to make a complaint <laughs> as a group for things that didn't make any sense. Things that, you know, like one group of there hundreds of people on Twitter who were agreeing that I was unethical because I was talking about intimate partner violence, even though I only had a license in marriage and family therapy. <laughs> Have I talked about this with y'all? Even if I had, it kind of bears repeating because it really gets me. Their premise was that licensed mar marriage and family therapists have it's unethical for them to talk about intimate partner violence. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense at all if you understand anything about my field. They were essentially accusing me of something like I was talking about anesthesiology or something, which obviously is completely outside of my scope, and I know nothing about. I have no education in anesthesiology. Intimate partner violence is not one of those things. Plus, even if it was something that was kind of specialized in terms of an area, and it is, uh, uh, they only know I'm a licensed mar marriage and family therapist. None of them had my my resume or my background they the only detail they were holding on to was that i was a licensed marriage and family therapist <laughs> never mind the fact that i have an additional master's and an additional doctorate and i'm trained as a psychologist and i'm a professor and i used to treat perpetrators who were court mandated in a court mandated dv group and i've gone to multiple lectures and i've read multiple things i've treated multiple perpetrators anyway so i thought for sure you know someone's going to make a complaint because those they were making complaints about all sorts of people you know if you watch the trial with me uh there were a number of psychologists and psychiatrists that had provided expert witness testimony and i believe several of them received numerous license complaints against them just because they were involved in the trial and people wanted to attack them, which I, f I just find to be abhorrent, you know, people doing their jobs. And anyway, so, so I get this letter, uh, I don't know, about a month ago, the disciplining authority for your marriage family therapist license credential has received and reviewed a report alleging you committed unprofessional conduct. And uh, when I read that, I thought, oh, I bet you anything that was someone from the trial, because that's such an, that, that would be the thing that they would accuse me of, right? Because it's not like I, I, there was an allegation that I messed up treatment with a client or that I broke confidentiality. You know, if, if you're some Miranda on the internet, you couldn't make those claims because you wouldn't know. The only thing you could really say is unprofessional conduct, right? Anyway, so then going on here. The report was closed without an investigation or disciplinary action. 
the report will not appear on your provider credential search web page because no action was taken against your credential. So when I received this letter, I just got a little bit of a kick out of it. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to frame this and I'm going to put it in my office. It's a badge of honor as a content provider who talks about psychology. <laughs> it's a rite of passage. It's, it's, it's right up there with my, you know, when you, when you cross a certain threshold of, of subscribers on YouTube, they send you, they call it a button, but it's, you know, it's just a plaque. And I, I have this silver plaque that indicated that I have over a hundred thousand subscribers and, you know, similar that this letter, then I, I, you know, I just sort of forgot about it. And then the other day I, I'm walking around with the dogs and Stacy, and it suddenly occurs to me that. I do have a lawyer who is there to defend me against these things, and she should probably know about this letter. I mean, this is a big deal. Um, you know, it's, many therapists never receive a letter like this. I would venture most therapists never receive a letter like this. I called her and told her about it, and and instantly she's like, oh, my God, when did you get the letter? And I was like, oh, I don't know, a month ago. And she's like, well, we got to talk about it. And and I'm like, oh, well, I just, you know, I just thought I'd just briefly, I don't know, it's just not a big deal to me. And she's, so she starts really, you know, because she's a lawyer, she's very interested and she's very protective of me <laughs> and she's scared. And, and as she starts to talk about it, I start getting scared. And I'm like, oh, my God. So... I had this long conversation with her and I was like, yeah, I guess I, I should have told you right away. I don't know why I did not And, you know, we talked a lot about it and I started getting more paranoid. I was like, could it have been a client? Cause th this letter that they send you, it, it doesn't, it just, it doesn't say anything. It just says, you know, there was a report of unprofessional conduct. We found it to be completely unfounded. And so we didn't, we didn't even investigate it. Oh, another thing my lawyer said was, according to her, many of the allegations are investigated. You know, she was saying there's not a really high threshold for the department to investigate something. So the fact that they did investigate it must mean that the allegation was so ridiculous that they didn't even bother to investigate even a little bit. So that is interesting <laughs> but i didn't know what the allegation was or from who it, from who it was from but in the letter they say if you want to get the public information you know the publicly available information then you have to submit this request for public records and so i did and i got the letter today or yesterday or some yesterday or today and so it, it has the actual complaint it actually has the full report and there's all sorts of information, but the main bit is, you know, what the person sent in. So I have it and I'm going to share it with y'all. Now, the, the funny thing is, before I read this, is that, uh, b you know, because there was an investigation, the, the state, the Department of Health, as a courtesy, they don't publicize that this even happened as a way of trying to protect the licensee from scrutiny because someone made an unfounded allegation and so uh, they keep it private but i am talking about it in public <laughs> regardless <laughs> you know usually people would be like oh i'm never going to talk about this ever but um but uh so here we go so I, I i believe you fill this out online it's just a form you fill out online and it says this is them typing it in it says this person is an mft and then they list my license number and this person is a marriage and family therapist and is not a licensed psychologist, but they represent themselves as a psychologist and use the term doctor across their very wide, very public marketing and promotional platforms, their website, YouTube, and Patreon. And they provide links to these things. So <laughs> this is very similar to what I assumed the complaint was, you know, the intimate partner violence uh, uh, accusation. So let's read this. This person is an MFT. It's true. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. And by the way, you know, I've talked about this before, but just briefly, I could be a licensed psychologist as well or in lieu of, because, you know, originally I was a marriage and family therapist, became licensed back in the late 90s. And then I became trained as a psychologist, went back to school, got another master's, got a doctorate. And I'm trained as a psychologist, and all I needed to do was just take the test. 
that's all I needed to do. But there was no reason for me to get a license in psychology because I was already licensed to practice in the state of Washington. The only slight benefit would be maybe insurance companies might pay me a little bit more per hour, but not, but not a lot. And I thought that's not really worth it to me because it, you have to pay money to have another license, you know, and plus as a professor in a marriage and family therapy program, I, I, I think, I don't, don't quote me on this, but I think I had to retain my license in marriage and family therapy to be a professor in the marriage and family therapy program. So essentially I'd have two licenses and I'd have to pay, you know, and I think it's like $500,000 a, a year to get licensed or so. I don't know. It's, and I didn't have that money. And so I'm just like, well, why would I, and the test is not easy. There's a lot of studying. <laughs> so I thought, what's the point? Um, I, I, I think I always figured someday I would, but then time just, you know, kept creeping on and I just, I just never bothered. I've always just defaulted to not calling myself a psychologist, uh, because I'm not a licensed psychologist, but there, there were times when I was called a psychologist, which I won't bore you with in other contexts. And, and it was considered to be on the up and up. I, I don't really care. I, I, I don't care what I'm called. I don't need to be called a psychologist. It does get annoying sometimes when media people will introduce me as a, as a psychologist and I'll have to correct them, which is weird. You know, like a, another YouTuber will have me on their channel and they'll be like, psychologist, Dr. Kirkonda. And I have to say, but I, by the way, I'm not, a, I'm not actually a psychologist. I'm I'm a psychotherapist and I'm a marriage and family therapist and I'm trained as a psychologist, <laughs> you know, just all this stuff. And they're like, huh? And yeah, it just gets kind of annoying. But anyway, so they say, you know, this person is, is, an, is a marriage and family therapist and not a licensed psychologist. Okay, that's true. But they represent themselves as a psychologist. Okay, I have never represented myself as a psychologist. Like I said, I think there are times when media people will call me a psychologist and I I won't hear it and I won't correct them or I won't have a chance to correct them. Like sometimes I'll be interviewed for a, a news article or something and I'll tell them exactly how to introduce me and they'll forget or they won't write it down. And then they'll write Dr. Kirkonda psychologist on YouTube and I'll be like, Ugh. and you know, I'll, I'll email them, but they won't correct it. And, and I'm, I'm pretty anal about that. And plus I, I don't understand why we have to always use that word psychologist and two i don't understand why it's such a coveted word there's so many other words that i can say that i am i'm a psychologist i mean i'm sorry i'm a i'm a psychotherapist i'm a therapist you know whenever i introduce myself i say i'm a therapist and a professor and i find those two words to be powerful very important words, very descriptive words to me. The word psychologist, even if I was a licensed psychologist, I still don't think I would introduce myself as a psychologist because psychologists can mean so many different things. Therapist is a very specific thing. Psychologists might do therapy, but they might not. Whereas therapists always do therapy, <laughs> you know, I'm generally speaking. So anyway, they, they say that I'm representing myself as a psychologist. So you're just like, huh, when, when did I ever say that? I never say that. But then you hear the second part of the, of the sentence. He uses the term doctor across, across his very wide, very public marketing and promotional platforms. I just love that phrase. Uh, you know, so, and I've seen this before as well. And I've seen this actually, uh, uh, Dr. Todd Grande, if you know him on YouTube, he was accused of this as well, that because he uses the, the term doctor, Dr. Todd Grande, Dr. Kirkonda, that we're claiming to be psychologists when we're not, which is just one of the dumbest things. How, you know, saying that your doctor so-and-so just says that you have a doctor, that's it. And in my field, like at my university, for example, the professors, most of which have doctorates, are all referred, most of the time, the students refer to them as doctor so-and-so. People call me Dr. Honda at the university. I'm guessing other universities do a very similar thing. I don't know, but that's the way it's always been done in my, in my field. And so this notion that somehow doctor only refers to psychologists, I mean, it's just the dumbest, <laughs> the dumbest thing. But uh, so that's the allegation that I'm unprofessional because I represent myself as a psychologist and I use the term doctor. And then this phrase, you know, he uses the term doctor across their very wide, very public marketing and promotional platforms. You know, you can just hear the, the, I don't know, the contempt <laughs> and the, uh, the emotion, I suppose, behind the allegation. Their website, YouTube, and Patreon, yeah. 
not a very long complaint, right? And I don't know what the review board, how they saw it, but they didn't even investigate it. I just thought I'd share that with you all. I find it to be interesting. And so on, on one hand, when I didn't know the details of the complaint, I was just kind of, like I said, kind of tickled by the fact that I got it. <laughs> it just felt like, oh, how fun, a, a, a milestone in my career. But when I read the actual complaint, it, it got under my skin, you know, it's it because there was so many things like this happening during the trial last summer and so many public statements like this with, like I said, hundreds of people upvoting it and retweeting it and agreeing with it and commenting on it. You know, it wasn't just one or two weirdos on the Internet. It was like whole a whole mob of people that had this completely different world that they were living in, in in terms of facts and understandings of ethics and laws and and even a different world in terms of what I even said. And I don't even remember if this was a pro Amber Heard group or a pro Johnny Depp group because there were crazies on both sides. <laughs> I mean, it was it was insane. Now, um, I do not think that any of you made this report. I think based on the verbiage and just even before I saw the specifics of the complaint, I immediately figured it was just one of those fly-by-night people that... So here, I don't know, I know I've gone over this so many times. Ten years from now, I'm still going to be talking about this fucking trial. But there were people who had watched maybe one video or had watched, you know, one or two videos or maybe even just 15 minutes of one. Because each of the videos that I, I posted 60 plus one hour videos in that, that summer, <laughs> like daily. It was, it was insane. Uh, the amount of work, oh my God, I was so overworked at the time. I think I was averaging something like 70 hours a week or something. I mean, that is just not humanly good. Anyway, so th there was a group of people that would watch maybe one or two videos, and there were people that were like, oh, my God, this is the best. And and then they would never watch anything else, and they they would never listen to the to the podcast. They weren't really interested in my other material. And they were they thought it was great. And then there was a group of people who thought – I was a complete idiot and that I had no idea what I was talking about and they would state it as such. And then there was a, th a third group of people. These are all the people who aren't you, by the way. <laughs> and then there was a third group of people who hadn't even seen my channel, had never watched any of my videos. And because the internet mobs, they talk with each other all day long about this one topic, you know, the, the pro Amber Heard mob would talk and the pro Johnny Depp mob, mob would talk and someone would enter into the mob online and say like there's this Kirk Honda guy who is and both ends of the spectrum thought I was against them because I wasn't siding with them they're they're attacking me and there were mobs of people that I was fairly convinced had never even heard what I had said they I was just labeled as someone that was the enemy and they were going to do everything in their power to take me down. I just thought like, what did I do to you? <laughs> like, what did I say? You know, pull a quote from one of my videos that actually demonstrates the, what you're saying about me, you know, That's, anyway. So maybe this is the final chapter, the final giggle that we get to have at the end of this, as we read this complaint intake form, <laughs> <laughs> he is not a licensed psychologist, but they, but he represents himself as a psychologist, and he uses the term doctor across his very wide, very public marketing and promotional platforms. <laughs> uh, let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. I, I just needed to get into that because, I don't know, I guess, you know, I, I think I act like it's no big deal. But it's a big deal to me, it, especially when I read those. It's it's hard on my soul. I guess it feels good. Sorry, now I'm talking about it again. It feels good to have the Department of Licensing who don't know me, presumably, and they're the authority, right? And they're interested in protecting the public. That's their job. They live and breathe sanctioning people who have licenses, you know, there are many complaints to come into their office and I'm sure they consider it their 
moral responsibility to actually protect the public from incompetent and bad actors in the licensing mental health medical health field and so to to hear that they just didn't even investigate it they're just like yeah there's nothing there (laughs) because so often i feel like i'm just pissing in the wind online when these groups of people attack me and i'm just like um where do i begin with and then when i defend myself they just say well you're lying or you don't know what you're talking about and then there's nothing you can do right but when the department of licensing just says no to the trolls no to the mobs online no to the idiots that have been attacking me uh for you know it's fine to criticize me it's fine to give me feedback it's fine to tell me when i'm wrong um even if i'm not necessarily wrong but at least identify something that at least sounds maybe that i was wrong not just this random allegation that I'm not supposed to use the word doctor when I have a doctorate. <laughs> um, that kind of shit, you know, it just, uh, and, and again, it wasn't just one person. There were hundreds of people online that were talking amongst themselves. Agreeing. Anyway, yeah, so I guess it feels both, it's reopening that trauma for me, and I don't use the word trauma lightly, but it's also vindicating in some way. And, and by the way, I believe that the complainant will also receive notification that it wasn't investigated because it didn't make any sense. (laughs) Um, I suppose they might re complain, but I I suspect that um, it was during the trial and the anger has subsided, hopefully. So let's do an OPP. These people became patrons all the way back in 2020 and have stayed patrons this whole time. We have Jenny from from Germany. We have Lauren, Nicole, Andrea, up to your patron, Alyssa, Charlie, Jay, and Randy from God Knows Where. Thank you. We have Nadine from London. We have Ethel's Insides. We have Lisa from Albuquerque, Rosalva from New York, Alyssa from Maple Valley, Washington, a lovely Maple Valley, which is uh, near and dear to my heart because it's near kind of where I grew up. It's also near where I was born and rented. Raquel from Antioch, California. We have Rebecca from London, another London person. We have Maxim from Kiev, uh, from Ukraine. We ha- hope you're doing okay. Uh, we have Shelly from Ohio. We have Martina from the Netherlands. We have Kylie from Idaho, up to your patron Kylie. We have Callum from Great Britain. We have Iona or Ilona from New South Wales, Australia. We have Chelsea from Georgia. By the way, I just watched some. So there's this one YouTuber that I like from New South Wales, I believe. I think his channel is called I Did a Thing. And it's comedy where he makes different uh, engineering projects at his house. And they're, it's, they're really goofy. Like he was making this paint gun to protect his friend who was another YouTuber who had his house burned down. And I was like, what? There's a YouTuber in New South Wales who had his house burned down. And then I looked at his channel and he's called... Um, I can't remember his name, but I think if you're from Australia, you probably know about him because there's this politician that he's been going after. And it was a really interesting story of corruption in the government there. And then this one YouTuber goes after him and, and there's all these shenanigans by the government and by the police. And now his house is burned down and there's all these lawsuits. And it's just, it's incredible that this one, I don't know if this YouTuber is on the up and up, but it just, it kind of looks like this YouTuber has the resources because of the amount of money he's making and the resources he can pull from. Like he raised a million dollars from his audience to pay for his legal fees and, and whatnot. His name is Friendly Jordies. He's on on YouTube. Anyway, it's really an interesting story. So uh, why am I talking about that? Oh yeah, OPP. For, so we had Iona or Elona from from New South Wales. We have Chelsea from Georgia. We have Jess from London. Three people from London. We have Andrea from California. Thank you so much for becoming a patron all the way back in 2020 and staying a patron through thick and thin. Super cool of you. All right, this next email is from Anonymous Annual Upper Tier Patron from Arizona. She says, what's the answer to making quality therapy accessible to all Americans? 
I recently lost the best therapist I've ever had because he no longer participates with insurance panels. I've been trying out different therapists that accept my insurance, but most of them just feel like I'm chatting with a friend and I never make significant progress with them. I've warmed myself to trying a new non-insurance therapist, but she charges almost $200 an hour and I can't afford this. Something is very wrong with this. I can't believe this country I live in. Insurance blows. That's a given. I hate to ask this, but are some therapists just greedy? I'd really, I'd gladly take up the fight to fix it, but I don't know where to start. End of email. Yeah, I get it. I'm really sad for you, patron, and I've been there before myself uh, to some extent. It's atrocious. It's criminal. It's awful. And there's so many reasons why this is the way that it is. But I'm just going to assume that under your insurance, there is a a good fit out there. It might just take a while to find the right one. And I know that sucks that you'd have to try out five, ten therapists before you find the right one, but it's worth it. But yeah, um, you're asking for a solution. You know, what do we do to take up the fight to fix it? Well, I'll tell you exactly what to do, people. Taxes. Taxes, 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 funds, 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 money, 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 money pays for this sort of stuff. If we decided as a collective to ask our representatives and vote representatives that represented us in this way to allocate the funds, either by pulling money away from, let's say, the military or by raising funds, by raising taxes, property taxes, for example, and uh, allocating that money towards things like education and mental health and medical health, for that matter, we would be in a much different situation. We have that ability to do that. We wouldn't have to tax uh, even the middle class. We could we could tax the rich people, you know, people who earn more than two hundred thousand dollars a year or something like that, and. We could pay for it. The money is there. But because we don't pay attention to it, because we don't vote like that, because we vote for other reasons, or we don't lobby our representatives enough. All right, let's take a break. We get back more emails. All right, we're back from the break. Anonymous upper tier patron, she wrote in and said, I have been a patron for two years now. Your podcast has helped me immensely. I've been avidly listening to your Amber Heard versus Johnny Depp trial reactions. Just chiming in here. This email must have been, must must be pretty old, (laughs) given that. (laughs) But uh, just going on here. Um, I was diagnosed with borderline when I was 32, and now I'm 46. I have the pervasive patterns, volatile relationships, et cetera, et cetera. So this was very enlightening to me. As a marriage and family therapist, what is the percentage of couples that come to you for help who live in relationships like Johnny Depp and Amber Heard? Okay, just chiming in here. So it's hard to know exactly what their relationship was like, but we did get a glimpse into their relationship, especially when you hear the audio recordings. And... I would say I I used to have this percentage breakdown that lasted for a good amount of time. When, when I was full-time practicing as a, as a therapist, I had a, you know, a fair amount of couples and I started getting this percentage feel of the landscape. And I, 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 what I would say is that a a third, 33% of my clients were very easy. They came in with minimal issues sometimes they were just coming in prophylactically to you know uh, you know make sure that their relationship was really good so they didn't need therapy in the future or something like that and sometimes sometimes they just needed a few sessions or the sessions were very pleasant with them <laughs> there was very little conflict um and so that was about a third the other third was in the middle and there was significant conflicts significant issues that might take a couple years to work on, but the sessions were workable. The clients were differentiated enough to look at themselves, to take responsibility and to make requests without being hostile and working together with some coaxing. And then another third were very conflictual and fairly undifferentiated, 
these sorts of clients, these couples would be hard to work with, but I, I took it on. These, this was kind of what I got into the field to do to work with people like this. Often one or both would be on some personality sort of spectrum, some um, you know, significant amounts of attachment security, significant amounts of schemas at play and lots of um, not taking responsibility, not apologizing, lots of hostility. I would hear about a lot of conflict outside of the session. And so I would say that the Johnny Depp Amber Heard presentation fits into that. Having said that, most of the couples that I saw in that lower third, I don't know if I'm saying lower, but the more conflictual third, I was able to help them. It might take five, 10 years, but I was able to help them. If they stuck it out, we could we could gain ground. I might not see gains in the short term, you know, like a after a couple of years, I might be like, have we, have I helped them at all? But eventually I learned that if, you know, if we stick it out and I, I, and I just keep plugging away with them and, and they keep coming back and they just keep working on it five, seven, eight years into it, we would definitely see results. And so I think that that was absolutely possible with the two of them, because I think there was a kernel of love, even when they were highly conflictual with each other that could have been salvaged. Uh, the problem is, is they did go to couple therapy, but they seemingly didn't go for very many sessions. And the sessions that they did go for were really weird. I, I got the impression that the therapist made accommodations for them based on the fact that they were famous and their schedules were really wonky, you know, from filming all these different things. And so they would have sessions that would be like four, four hours long or something. And sometimes one of them wouldn't show up until midway through, or I don't know, it, it was very chaotic and it, they didn't really seem to give it a, a fair shake, um, which is unfortunate for everyone going on with your email. I felt that the dirty laundry that was aired during the trial was actually pretty mild in my experience. Has violence and rage just been normalized in my family? Or is the Johnny Depp Amber Heard experience more common than the shocked media allows for? End of email. Yeah, based on what you're saying, I suspect that your family went through something particularly chaotic, you know, not incredibly strange. There's certainly a lot of families that are like Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. But the fact that it felt mild to you, I think that says something about what you went through. Because when I was watching the trial, I, and when I think about it, just sort of the highlights of what was being told to us, it was extreme. I mean, some of this stuff, the drug use, the intoxication level, the violence, conflict, the yelling at each other, the accusations, the hostility, the, the behaviors, you know, with the knife and the drawing of the blood on the walls. I mean, it, it was extreme. If that felt like mild to you, then yeah, I think that says something about what you went through, which I'm really sorry if, that, if you did go through something like that. All right, this next email is from annual upper tier patron Nadine from Beirut. She says, Hi, Dr. Kirk. I understand that you play and have played Dungeons and Dragons. I was completely unaware that initially there was this strong link to Satanism and Dungeons and Dragons in the 1980s. Did you play Dungeons and Dragons during that time period? If so, what was the, that experience like? Were your parents concerned or did they not care about you playing Dungeons and Dragons? I'm curious if this varied from state to state and if this was prominent in Seattle. End of email. Yeah, so... If you asked me a, a few years ago, I probably would have said, no, I don't remember my parents falling into that mindset that Dungeons & Dragons was satanic. Uh, but I started remembering some things. And then the last time I was hanging out, well, not the last time, but one of the last times I was hanging out with my family, I actually asked my mom about it. And she does remember, well, because it was because my nephew is getting really into Dungeons and Dragons and he doesn't know how to play, but he loves the pictures and the figures and the books. And so we, him and I were really nerding out together with it. And I asked my mom, I was like, mom, did you believe that this was safe? Because um, he actually, my nephew has one of my old books and on the front cover is this giant picture of a, 
of a demon, like a devil. <laughs> and the devil is, is killing people or trying to kill people. And I, I just occurred to be like, huh, well, no wonder they thought it was satanic because it literally kind of is. It's not satanic like the satanic religion, but Satan and Satan's minions are literally in the game. <laughs> you fight with them or you could be them, I suppose. Not back then necessarily, but... But anyway, so I asked my mom, and she's like, yeah, actually, I did. You know, I was really concerned about it. There was a lot of worry about it. But I don't, I don't remember my, my parents really doing anything about it. I don't remember them, like, taking my books away. Or no, maybe my mom actually said she tried to take my books away, but I found them or something. They didn't put a lot of effort into it. Let's just, let's just put it that way. But yeah, uh, it, it was almost like this parallel world because... When I discovered Dozens of Dragons when I was around 10 years old, uh, there were some friends in my neighborhood that were older who played it, and I don't know what it was about it. I, I knew nothing about the game, but I just knew that I wanted to play it. Like, I, I, I just saw the picture or had this really brief description told to me when I was 10, and I just thought, oh my God. God, I must know what this is. I and I, I was bugging one of my close friends to to bug his brother because his brother played. And I don't know exactly what happened, but I got my hands on some of the books, and I had no idea what these books meant. I mean, they were so complicated; they're hard to understand even today. They were written very poorly back then, and um, I, I I would try to piece together some version of the game that was kind of like D&D, but it wasn't really. And I don't know, it was just such a magical world. I just loved it. Um, kind of getting back to my inner child, right? Like uh, one of the ways I can access my inner child is by picking up these old Dungeons & Dragons books and remembering what it felt like to um, to read these books and to look at the pictures and to have the imagination and and the the goals really, you know, like I want to play this character and do this thing, you know, it was just really a great time and have these fun experiences with my friends. And so I lived in that world for many years and, and a lot of my friends got into it as well to the point where like for birthday parties, we would give each other Dungeons and Dragons stuff. And, and my parents were supportive and my parents would literally buy, I, I didn't have a job, I didn't have money. So my parents would buy all that stuff for me. And uh, so I lived in that world, but then there was this parallel world that was very concerned that I didn't really come into contact with very much, but my mom was telling me about it, you know, that there were there was talk about it in the church and this sort of thing. If you would have asked me when I was 12 years old if it was a, if the satanic panic around Dungeons and Dragons, if I knew about it, I would have probably said no. I'd be like, huh? Because, you know, parents are always trying to get in your business and they're always like a little concerned about this and that. And I feel like that's kind of how they were about Dungeons and Dragons. They were just mild. I, my dad wasn't concerned at all. It was, it was all just my mom, I think. And, uh, but they never interfered. In fact, they, you know, they bought all the books for me. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I remember this one time my mom bought me this one D&D &D book and it was a summer day. I'll never forget it. it, it if you're a D&D &D fan from the 80s, which I'm guessing none of you are, but there was this one module, an adventure that was based on the uh, Alice in Wonderland story. And so you you get pulled into this land and you actually fight like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Is that the name of the characters? And the Cheshire Cat and the Queen and the cards like you actually battle that mad hatter <laughs> and they can cast spells on you and they have these special abilities and it's it's really a hard uh, adventure to go on and when my mom bought it for me it was a summer day i'll never forget and for some reason we went to like a baseball field and to hang out and my little brother was there and i remember i i stayed in the car because i just wanted to read this book i just wanted to look at the pictures and read the stats and <laughs> just it always just there's just certain memories that stick out, you know, and it, it was such a, such a, I just loved it, you know, I just loved looking at it. Anyway, so, you know, I'm getting in connection with my inner child right now. But yeah, in terms of region, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, was every region in the United States the same when it came to the satanic panic? I don't know. I, I don't, I don't remember it being a big part of my life. I, I could imagine it being a bigger part of 
some community. I don't remember other parents being concerned about it really. So yeah, I, I, I don't think it was really a big thing in Seattle, but I could be wrong. All right, this next email is from Upper Tier Patron from Minnesota. She says, could you provide commentary on Stephen and Olga's relationship as a jumping off point to talk about possible abuse and signs of intimate partner violence? End of email. Um, I don't know. So that's on 90 Day Fiance. I don't know about them. I haven't heard of them, but, you know, I'll add them to the list for sure. Sounds like an interesting couple to watch for the future. All right, this next email is from annual upper tier patron Afshin from Germany. He writes, this is a question for Kirk. Me and my girlfriend are working with a new therapist in here in Germany. Before the start of the first session, he sent me 600 questions. He sent us 600 questions to fill out. And only based on the answers to these questions, he diagnosed our depression and our schemas and even the anger issues of my girlfriend. He gave us great support, actually. But now I am double thinking and likely to change my therapist because some diagnoses, like diagnoses for borderline, are time consuming. For what diagnoses are a questionnaire good enough? The therapist used the answers to the questions to suggest me and my girlfriend's compatibility, and it might be enough for that purpose. End of email. Yeah, so I don't know what measure your therapist was using. 600 questions is a lot. Uh, and it's hard to know what you mean by diagnosis, but the, the general question of, I think what you're asking is, you know, could a therapist, a clinician, just administer a survey, a self-report questionnaire, and diagnose from that? And the answer is, generally speaking, no. But there are some things that you could diagnose with not a lot of interview after the fact, like a Beck depression inventory, for example. It asks, I don't know, 15, 20 questions, rating scale questions, and it, st it spits out an index. But really, if, if I administered this survey, and it only takes like five minutes to fill out, and I'd never met someone before, and I not only looked at the index, but I actually looked at the answers, and I saw that you know, they think about suicide occasionally. Over the last two years, they've entered into a state of low mood, and they have very low motivation. They no longer take pleasure in things. They are sleeping 16 hours a day. They have very low energy. They're, they cry occasionally. They don't feel optimistic about the future. They're isolating a lot. Then I, just based on those responses, if I believed them to be honest and competently answered, then if I was forced to I, I could diagnose them with depression, major depressive disorder pretty easily, right? But I would never do that. I would ask, you know, verbally, I'd be like, so you, this is how you filled it out. Tell me more. What's going on? When did it start? You know, I'd get a lot more detail and only then would I diagnose someone. But there are situations where you might have to, or just for speed's sake, you know, sometimes in couple therapy, you want to move pretty quickly and you don't have time to do full assessments on each individual. So, you know, could someone competently diagnose certain issues from a 600 question questionnaire? Yeah, maybe, you know, it, it depends. It depends on what they were saying. But generally speaking, that's not what the standard of practice is. The standard of practice is if you use a questionnaire, you would use that data, even if it was a 600 question questionnaire, you would, you would use that data as, you know, good data, but you would also have at least some interview component to corroborate or triangulate or confirm or get more detail so that you could confidently diagnose people with the various things that we diagnose people with. And certainly something like borderline, <laughs> um, so, so yeah, your question was, you know, what are some things that are, sort of lend themselves more to questionnaires? Any of the depressive disorders, um, any of the anxiety disorders, PTSD it is pretty easily diagnosed, especially with like the trauma symptom inventory. I'm trying to think. Um, attachment style is probably easily, it's not a diagnosis, but it is a clinical label. So that's off the top of my head. But um, things like personality disorders, or psychotic disorders, dissociative disorders, unless the person has a lot of insight into their symptoms, which isn't usually the case with those disorders, then 
a survey would not do much help it would be one tool but as you often hear me talk about when i do, when i diagnose someone with a personality disorder um, I might have a hypothesis in the first session or maybe the first few sessions, but I don't feel confident about the diagnosis until we're months into therapy with the individual, you know, so until till I get a lot more data, a lot more experience with them. And then if you're a, a social worker working at a hospital, you might literally have five minutes to diagnose someone. Um, does that mean that you should just take a guess and document it? No, but sometimes there's a lot of pressures to give some kind of label and, and to provide some sort of provisional diagnosis moving forward. And so, you know, there's a lot of variability is the thing. And I am on one end of the spectrum. So you're not going to find a lot of people in my category that take as long as I do to diagnose people. Most people are much faster. And when I would talk with colleagues about this, I would get annoyed at how quickly they would diagnose people and how how sure they were of themselves. <laughs> and I, and you know, I don't know. Maybe they were right. Maybe they were always right and I'm just too cautious or something. But I it just always sounded really hasty and really self-confident. A lot of the people that I that I diagnosed with a personality disorder, I would say maybe about a third I'm not super confident in the label because they don't fit neatly into that category. And and often I don't think in terms of that label anyway. I think I think in terms of their specific schemas, right? Their their specific relational traumas that I'm working on. I don't I'm not thinking about, oh, they're borderline. I'm thinking more of what their specific relational abandonment or relational betrayal that they went through as a, as a child. That's more at the front of my mind, more the front of my mind in terms of trying to help with their self-awareness and their corrective experiences. So um, anyway, all right, well, good questions again, y'all. And if I sound a little weird or, I don't know, slurry at the end of this episode, it's because it's midnight and I should be in bed. I'm also trying to be a little quiet because I don't want to wake up my wife, who's trying to sleep, um, I think I heard her kind of stirring, and I was like, oh, crap, am I talking too loud? <laughs> so, so everyone, I'll do some ASMR. So, everyone, take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. <laughs>